It's easy to say the words, I forgive you, but meaning those words is another thing altogether. There are many times we'd like to forgive and forget, but more often than not, we just say we forgive, and we never forget. The man in today's episode wanted to forgive, but how could he if he couldn't forget? Let's find out. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing you the story of a man who was plucked off of his warpath and set on the path to forgiveness. While the anger in him began to subside and the desire to forgive was there, he had a hard time forgetting the hurt people caused him. So who could show him how to truly forgive? We'll see just who that is on today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you'll want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. It's part two of the classic story of Stephen Lungu. I have heard the Go of home, it. fisherman! To hear this. And so, Lord, we thank you. No one wants to hear this. For your gift of salvation. How about for the gift you are about to get? I'm not here to fight. Look, people, look at this nice Bible. How about we really share God's word? Please don't. Please. Don't worry, Pastor. No, please. There's still some for you. I'm just here for those who want to listen. Well, it's a bit hard to hear with your lousy PA system. It's all we have. No doubt it was. Please, we're here in peace. I'm not. I brought my feasts. You don't have to do this. At the tender age of seven, Stephen Lungu, the young man in our story, was abandoned first by his father, then his mother. He lived in Rhodesia in Southern Africa. Nobody wanted him. He wore rags for shoes, foraged in garbage cans for food, and slept under a bridge. As a teenager, he joined a gang of revolutionaries trying to overthrow the white government. One night in May 1962, intending to blow up a tent revival, his life was changed as he listened to an evangelist. Oh God, I have nothing. I am nothing. I can't read. I can't write. My parents don't want me. Take me up, God. Take me up. I'm sorry for the bad things I've done. Jesus, forgive me and take me now. Thus began an extraordinary transformation from rage to joy. But the young man in our story had a long way to go. His only skilled trade was making petrol bombs. And buried deep in his heart was unresolved anger toward his parents. This is the conclusion of the classic true story of Stephen Lungu, right now on Unshackled. Hannes, a white missionary, bravely took me in as the first student in his Bible school. He taught me not only to read and write, but to have good manners and hygiene. No one had ever cared about me before, and I blossomed under his care. But I also chafed at the constant instruction. By 1965, I was preaching, sometimes with Shadrach, the evangelist who led me to Christ. Hannes has trained you well, Stephen. He's intense, Shadrach. <laughs> I imagine so. But then I came to him much like a wild boar. He's had to teach me everything. He sees potential in you. He's always talking about trusting in the Lord. Walking in the light, right? Exactly. He puts more emphasis on how we live our lives rather than the grades we get in class. So does God, Stephen. I can tell you like preaching. Yes, but sometimes it's very dangerous. Anger is running as high in Rhodesia as it is here in Zambia. But God is still in charge. One night, we set up our tents and hundreds of men came. That's good! No, 
It wasn't to hear the gospel, but to throw stones at us. They were out to kill us. Oh my, it is scary. But what I've learned though, is that where God leads, he provides. We'll see how the crowd does when we preach tomorrow in the market. The next day was when an angry mob tore our Bibles to pieces, demolished our sound system, and beat the both of us. Yet, through it all, God's presence never left us. And I learned a powerful lesson. <coughs> Stephen! Stephen, where are you? I'm here. <coughs> are you hurt? Nothing serious. You? I think I'll be fine. I realize I should have listened to your warnings. You know what I realize? My life is truly in God's hands. <laughs> it is. We must hold our lives lightly, my friend. Not long after, the mission sent a young Englishman to head the evangelistic work in Rhodesia. He was soon pushing and prodding me more than Hanas, the missionary who rescued me. What agony I endured because of my fears. I'll wait back here. Come on, we're both going to the door. No, this is Rhodesia. I can't just walk up to a white man's house. <laughs> Actually, it's quite easy. What will I say? He won't want me. You don't know that. God created you and died for you. You're as good as anyone. No, it's not how it is. You've had less chances, that's all. Are you going to blow this one because you're fearful? Fine. What do I say? Start with, good day, sir. Don't shuffle. Look him in the eye. When he invites you to sit, no hunching over. All right. When other whites tried to put me in my place, Patrick stood his ground, determined to pull me up to his level. He was forever urging me on, especially when it came to practicing reading and writing English. As the years passed, I did lose my shyness. I learned to be on time and to speak with confidence. There was only one problem. I was terribly lonely for a wife. And then I met Rachel on a trip to Malawi. I really enjoyed your preaching yesterday. Thank you. I think it was inspired. That means a lot to me. Can you tell me more about yourself? Sure. Uh, my father abandoned us when I was seven. I blamed myself because he never wanted me, didn't believe I was his son. How devastating. It was. Months later, my mother took us kids to the market and told us to stay put. She never came back. The heartbreak. I can't even imagine so much pain for someone so young. I was very bitter and angry. What happened? Us kids were placed in an orphanage until my aunt agreed to care for us. My father eventually came back, inviting me and my brother to live with him and his new wife. But they weren't good to us. How did you handle that? I only did for a while. When it became unbearable, I ran away to live with my aunt and little sister again. So life was good then? <laughs> Not hardly. Most of the time, I lived in a chicken coop. No one wanted me. I didn't go to school or anything. How did you survive? I ate from garbage cans and slept under a bridge. At 13, I tried to hang myself. Oh dear, but God spared you. Yes, I helped form a gang and we joined the revolutionary movement in Salisbury. We started riots and threw petrol bombs in parks and churches. We planned to blow up a revival tent one night, but instead, the Lord saved me. Praise his mighty name. Seven years later, here I am. God had a plan all along. Rachel, I know I just met you, but I'd love to write to you and for you to consider becoming my wife someday. Oh, thank you for your offer, Stephen. I'll be praying about it. How grateful I was for the missionary who painstakingly taught me how to write as I wrote Rachel love letters for the following year. Then I took a bus to Malawi to ask her decision. My suitcase was stolen on the way and I began to doubt that she would accept someone like me. We went for a walk while I tried to summon up my courage. Rachel, 
Have you thought about my offer? Yes, I have. And? Yes, Stephen. I will marry you. Well, I don't think you'd better. It will mean giving up your job, your home, your friends. And I'll never be able to give you anything. Stephen! I have no money. I have no house. Or even a bed. Stephen! I, I don't even have a suitcase any longer. Stephen! No, I can't possibly marry you. I have nothing. <laughs> will you listen to me? I'm not going to marry a house, bed, or clothes. I'm going to marry you. Rachel's affluent family was appalled at our decision, especially her uncles, who argued I might revert to throwing petrol bombs again. In the end, it was Rachel's mother who came to our rescue. Mother, this is Stephen from Rhodesia. The man I want to marry. Oh, it is so good to meet you. I prayed one of my daughters would marry a pastor. You have? For years. Do you mind if I pray for us? That's sweet, Mom. Almighty God, thank you for hearing my prayers and bringing Stephen into our lives. Bless this marriage, Lord. Be glorified in their lives together. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. You will not be my son-in-law. You will be my son. On our honeymoon, I contracted malaria and Rachel nearly lost me. Then we returned to Rhodesia where the mission found us a house, nine feet square. Rachel was everything a man could want and I thanked God every day for her. Meanwhile, Patrick continued to push me toward leadership. Why don't you do the organizing this time for the revival meetings in Umpopoma Township? No, I can't write letters and see the police and talk to churches. I'm not educated like you. Oh, what do you think I've been teaching you all these years? I'm an evangelist, not an organizer. You can do it, Stephen. You begin by writing a letter to the police to get permission for the meetings. No. Yes. They won't want to hear from a black man. Come on, Stephen, write it. What agony I endured as Patrick squeezed the inferiority complex out of me, forcing me to go to the police station alone. Then he arranged for me to preach at a white church in English. I was terrified, but he insisted. I wrote my sermon in my Shona language and he tore it up. The day before my sermon, I fasted and prayed, but I still was petrified as I stood before the packed church. It was nerve-wracking, to say the least. Well done, Stephen. Oh, oh, man, I thought I was going to die. You see how the Bible shook in my hands? No, I was too busy praying for you. I stumbled over words too often. When you described your salvation, how you walked to the altar with those petrol bombs, I've never heard you sound more confident. It was remarkable. I could hear people weeping when I finished, Patrick. I've never seen white people cry before. Your testimony touched many hearts, Stephen. This is why English is so important. You're right. If one more heart is touched for God, then it's worth it. Every time I achieved anything, Patrick pushed me towards something new. I left heel marks all the way as he dragged me into leadership. Over time, I focused less on my fear and more on God's will. In 1975, we went off to Mozambique. We didn't realize that it was the start of an intense persecution of Christians in that country. Although I secured official permission from the governor, soldiers beat us badly for preaching the gospel. But it was back in Salisbury that I received the greatest surprise of my preaching career. Folks, we'll get back to Stephen's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 73rd year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact, your support, allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, 
a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, Unshackled, we take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, let's get back to Stephen's story. Our open-air meetings in a black township were so well attended that I started preaching six times a day. By the time an evening service wrapped up with an altar call, I was so exhausted. I didn't really consider the little old woman who came forward smelling like alcohol. Excuse, excuse me. Yes? I would like to pray with you. Well, how about I connect you with one of our women counselors? No, I've already talked with them. I was wondering if you would pray with me. Mm. Yes, of course. Dear Lord, you know the heart of this woman. Touch her as only you can. Help her to know that you alone are God. Thank you, Father, for bringing her to repentance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Glory! Glory! Hallelujah! The pain is gone! The pain is gone! He's real! God is real! Oh, pray with me again. I want to be a Christian. I want Jesus! We knelt and prayed again, and this time she prayed as well. She went on and on. Fatigue overwhelmed me. Finally, she turned to me and smiled. Do you know that you are my son? Actually, I am your brother in the Lord. No, no, no. You are my son, and I am your mother. Back in Highfield, you and your brother, John, and your sister, Malesi, From what you said tonight, I know, I know I am your mother. What? After all these years? It's true. You live here now? I do. I married a Muslim. He will not like what you have done tonight. I know. He beats me badly already. I'm sorry. I'm in constant fear and pain because of him. Do you think you can help me? Let's meet here tomorrow and I'll see what I can do. Stephen, what is wrong? My dear, you're ill. What is it? Rachel, I... Stephen, tell (laughs) me what it is. My mother. I found her. Your mother? Is she dead? No. She came to the meeting tonight. Oh, Stephen! I didn't even recognize her, Rachel. I last saw her nearly 20 years ago. How is she? Terrible. Her husband beats her, and she smelled of alcohol. But she prayed to receive Christ. Praise God. Rachel, I'm ashamed to admit that I still hate her. I thought I had forgiven her years ago. But all those bad memories, that day in the market when she just walked away from us, the beatings while we were in the orphanage, the hunger, the fear, my anger came flooding back to me. Oh my God, what am I to do? God will help you love her, Stephen. I know that I must accept her. I can't abandon her. How I loved my beautiful wife. Although pregnant, she took my mother into our home, washed her, burned her clothes, and found her fresh ones, kept her off the beer, and my mother grew spiritually. I was dying to ask her why she left me and where she had gone so many years ago. But the truth, when it came, was more painful for me than not knowing. So, my mother abandoned us on the streets of Salisbury to go and brew beer 
in Bulawayo. That's what she told you? Yes. We were talking this afternoon. She said she had friends there. There must be more to it than that, Stephen. She was but a child herself at the time and didn't want to marry your father. She was a victim too. Remember that. She had nowhere to go. You should feel compassion for her. Part of me wants to forgive her, but I can't. I just can't. My inner anguish began to affect my work. How could I preach about forgiveness when part of me still hated my mother? But if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. I took leave and went back in the bush country for three days, fasting and praying. God, I must forgive her. How can I ever preach again about your love and forgiveness unless I do? On the third day, God lifted the hate and bitterness from me. And from his viewpoint, I saw my mother, a helpless, hurting soul. I went home, knowing I could love her now. How was the house hunting expedition? Successful. We found a little house for you nearby. Good. It's time I moved out. Two years is long enough to have a mother-in-law underfoot. You're always welcome, mother. I'll come back and help you with the children when the baby's born. You'll be all right alone, mother. Of course. I want to go to Bible school. Mother finished three years of Bible school and became an evangelist to children and women. Sometimes we shared the platform at meetings. In 1978, the mission asked me to launch a team in Malawi. No black African had ever led a team, but it was a challenge that for once I didn't protest. For three years, we lived in one room in my mother-in-law's house. Then I shared the platform with the white founder of a worldwide ministry. While he preached, I interpreted. Afterward, I shared my testimony with him. Brother, where have you taken this ministry of yours? Central and Southern Africa. Listen, your field could be much wider. Maybe we can be a vehicle for you to go across the world. Michael, I've had four months schooling my entire childhood. The missionaries in our ministry had to work very hard to teach me to read and write. I don't feel educated enough to go beyond this part of Africa. But God can use your testimony everywhere. We can equip and build you up. Give me time to pray about this. I'll have to ask my wife. They want you to leave your work and join their ministry? Rachel, I'm nearly 40 and I feel restless. I'd still be evangelizing for the church. And there would be such resources, such backup. We'd have a salary and a little house of our own. I'm thinking of you too living in one room with five children. You want to leave the mission after all they've done for you? Your own mother is now an evangelist for them. How could you? I discussed the proposal with my mentor and he encouraged me to pursue the position. I waited for God to speak to Rachel and several months later, she suddenly reversed her position and backed my decision to leave the mission and join the new ministry. During the interview in Nairobi, my old insecurities overwhelmed me, and I didn't even open the letter that arrived weeks later containing their decision. Well? No. How did they tell you no? What did they say was wrong? It's all in the letter. But you haven't even opened it. You know how I am about failure. Here, let me have it. Stephen, you've been accepted, you dear crazy man. So after 19 years with the mission that was used so greatly in my spiritual journey, I joined a worldwide ministry, moving my family to Harare. They provided me with a home in what had once been an all-white suburb. When I took my family there, they had no idea that it was our new home. Oh, oh this is nice. Oh, 
It's so beautiful. The garden, the curtains, the furniture. You like it then? Whose house is it? Welcome to your new home, Richard. You mean all this is ours? Yes. And to think, 30 years ago, I wandered the same neighborhood looking for food in the trash. I dreamed of having a house like this when I was a terrorist. And now it's ours. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Richard. It brought tears to my eyes the first time I walked through here alone and remembered what Jesus said in Matthew. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I was accepted in my position in 1982 and was soon preaching in many countries, even going down into gold mines to share the gospel with miners. In 1986, my mother discovered that my father was still alive, and we began searching for him through the local chiefs. One day, they led us to an old man propped against a tree. He stared at me fearfully. Are you the police? I haven't done anything wrong. No, I'm not the police. I'm your son, Stephen. Stephen? Yes, you are little Stephen. I remember you. <laughs> Did you come back to punish me? No, Papa. I came back to share God's love with you. In the following months and years, we visited many times, sharing memories and God's truth. Were you really a revolutionary? Absolutely. I was so full of hate for whites, especially Christians. Now I can see that Satan was just trying to destroy me. He's good at that. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I used to preach, you know. I was an elder. I remember. But I didn't really understand what I was doing. I made a lot of mistakes in my day. You needed Jesus, Papa. He said, you must be born again. You have to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Then he helps you overcome the temptations of your flesh and the world. I've been listening to Shadrach. He's an evangelist, and he says the same thing. I'm sure he does. It was Shadrach who God used to pierce my heart almost 25 years ago. Does he tell you that Jesus loves you? No matter what you've done, he offers forgiveness and new life. <laughs> yes, I believe that. Then you know that Jesus died for your sins, and he rose from the dead, and he's here right now waiting to give you a new life. Yes, I, I believe that. Would you like to pray to receive him now, Papa? Yes, I would, son. What a privilege to lead my Papa to our Heavenly Father. In 1991, his wife died. He was in his 90s then, so we took him into our home where Rachel took care of him for the next eight years, his past still haunted him. I feel terrible, Stephen, letting you suffer when you were little. How can you forgive me? Because God forgave me for all the terrible things I did. Don't think about the past. I can't help it. Papa, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sin debt. We are covered in his righteousness after salvation. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Do you really forgive me? Yes, I forgive you, Papa. Now think about Jesus and how he made you a new creature. In 1997, my father died at the age of 104. 
a committed Christian. How I bless the Lord for giving us those years together. Now, in her 70s, mother teaches the occasional women's meeting. My brother and sister are not yet believers, but we pray for them. In addition to our own children, we adopted seven. I still travel around the world, sharing the good news because there is no greater work on earth than telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Listening friend, the kind of transformation and reconciliation Stephen experienced are common in God's kingdom. He can do the same for you when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you need help in making this life-changing decision, please call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the new prize for this sweepstakes contest is yet another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. This plaque is gorgeous. It's contrasting chestnut brown outer ring and the light brown inner ring of the bark truly shows the diversity of God's creation. If you'd like a peek at this scripture plaque, you're welcome to visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. The deadline to enter is September 2nd. And next time, what does it mean to be strong? Getting really strong, Doug. I'm going to start calling you Kaz after the famous weightlifter. Yeah, I know who Kaz is, Julie. I'm nowhere near his level yet. Lifting weights might strengthen your body, but when you lack inner strength, even small things can tear your world apart. Uh, Are you okay, bud? My back. I thought you were taking perks for that. Oh, my prescription ran out. They never give me enough. The man in our story made a living training people to be strong, but his life was crumbling behind closed doors. I need more pills. I need the doctor to give me more pills. Then he learned how to find the type of strength that matters the most. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you saved? <laughs> Am I? Don't miss the true story of Doug Serlin. Coming soon on Unshackled. Heard in part two of the classic true story of Stephen Lungu were Ryan Priester, Lawrence Halliburton, Demetrius Troy, Alana Arenas, and Shaz Campbell. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Sound assistant, Holly Krajewski. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Kenitha Gabler and Kylie Hammond. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>